Hello viewers and welcome to my first recap video. Today I'm going to be recapping the games that I have done playthroughs and book comparisons for, which are for games 1 through 10. I'm going to quickly go over the elements of these first 10 games and then I'm going to talk about my favorite elements and then at the end have a special topic in which I'm going to be discussing the game dialogue. So in case you need a reminder of which games I'm going to be talking about, so which ones are 1 through 10, I'm just going to quickly give you a list of them. So number one, Secrets Can Kill. Two, Stay Tuned for Danger. Three, Message in a Haunted Mansion. Four is Treasure in the Royal Tower. Number five is The Final Scene. Number six is Secret of the Scarlet Hand. Seven is Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake. Eight is The Haunted Carousel. Number nine is Danger on Deception Island. And finally, number ten is The Secret of Shadow Ranch. So the next little bit is going to be a bit of the dry stuff because I'm just going to hopefully really quickly go through sort of the synopsis of each of the games and point out certain elements uh, that uh, you'll see sort of the purpose for after I've gone through them. So without further ado, number one, of course, was Secrets Can Kill. So the plot of this game was that Nancy is invited to Paseo Del Mar High School, where a student named Jake Rogers has been murdered. Nancy investigates this crime while also unearthing secrets held by other students. So this first book is also based on the first Nancy Drew case file entitled Secrets Can Kill. Our mystery is a murder. Is there a treasure? So I <laughs> I decided to keep track of treasures because this is a common theme, as we'll see as we get through the rest of these. So I'm just making a tally right off the go. So is there a treasure? No, there isn't. Our setting is a high school primarily and its surrounding area. The location is Florida. And our suspects, uh, four to five. This is because we have four physical characters who are suspects, but our fifth suspect we don't actually interact with until that person is revealed as being the culprit. So that's why that one is jotted down as four to five. Next is Stay Tuned for Danger. In this game, Nancy is invited to Worldwide Broadcast Television Studio to investigate threats made against one of their actors. And the threats turn into attempted murder. Bum bum bum. So this book is another of the case files. It's number 17, Stay Tuned for Danger. Our mystery in this game is a set of threats and eventually attempted murder. Treasure? No, there's no treasure. Our setting is a television studio and the surrounding area. Location is New York and there are five suspects. Game number three, Message in a Haunted Mansion, involves Nancy being invited to help a family friend renovate an old Victorian mansion. Accidents and so-called hauntings put the crew behind schedule and threaten their ability to open. This is the first of the games based on a digest paperback. This was number 122, The Message in the Haunted Mansion. The mystery is sabotage and hauntings. Ooh. Treasure, yes, this is the first game with a treasure. Setting is a partially restored Victorian mansion. And we stay there, we don't go to any other area. The location is California, and there are four suspects. Moving on to game number four, Treasure in the Royal Tower. The plot is Nancy is snowed in while on a ski vacation in Wisconsin. While there, she learns the history of Marie Antoinette, the castle, and its French tower. This is also based on a digest paperback, number 128, The Treasure in the Royal Tower. Our mystery is vandalism and theft. Is there a treasure? Well, yes, given that it's called a Treasure in the Royal Tower, yes, there is a treasure. The setting is a castle that's been converted into a ski resort. Our location is Wisconsin, and there are four suspects. Game number five is the final scene. Nancy's friend Maya plans to interview a film star before the destruction of a historic theater. Then Maya is kidnapped and Nancy has three days to locate her friend before the theater is demolished. So we are back to the case files. This was based on number 38, the final scene. The mystery for this one is a kidnapping. There is no treasure. Our setting is a historic theater located in Missouri and there are four suspects. Game number six is Secret of the Scarlet Hand. Nancy's interning at Beach Hill Museum when a rare jade Mayan artifact is stolen. Nancy searches for the thief while uncovering the secret history of Lord Pakal. This is based on number 124, The Secret of the Scarlet Hand from the Digest paperback series. Our mystery is a series of thefts. Treasure, I said yes, of sorts. Because this is ultimately what our culprit is motivated to seek and why they're behind what they're doing. It's not necessarily gold, but it's a an item of value, so I am considering this a treasure. Our setting is the museum and the surrounding area, located in Washington, D.C., and once again we have four suspects. 
game number seven is Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake. In this one, Nancy's on her way to visit her friend Sally, only to discover that Sally has left her new home out of fear. Ghost dogs attack her home each night. Well, that would be rather terrifying. So this one is based on two books, both from the Digest paperback series. The first is from the Ghost Stories collection. It's the second story called Ghost Dogs of Whispering Oaks. And then based on book number 167, Mystery by Moonlight. Our mystery is a haunting treasure. Oh, yes, there is. Our setting is a lake side, pardon me, a lakeside cabin and surrounding area located in Pennsylvania. And we have only three suspects. Game number eight is The Haunted Carousel. The plot for this one is Nancy is asked to investigate a theft and a haunting at Captain's Cove Amusement Park. While there, she learns the secrets and worries of the park's employees. This is also based on a digest paperback. It's number 72, a bit earlier than the uh, other ones that have come up so far. And it is also called The Haunted Carousel. Our mystery, we have a few. There's a theft, some accidents, and of course a haunting. Once again, that comes straight from the title treasure no but in a sense one is found this is in terms of the jewels from an old jewelry heist that are sort of stumbled upon they're not what's actually sought by our culprit nor by nancy well not entirely so i don't consider it a treasure it's not the motivation for our culprit the setting is an amusement park located in new jersey and suspects well we're back to four a danger on deception island is next Nancy is invited to Snake Horse Harbor for a holiday of whale watching. When her host's tour boat is vandalized, Nancy investigates other acts of sabotage and thievery on the small island. This is based on a digest paperback, shocking, <laughs> number 153, Whispers in the Fog. Our mystery is sabotage and burglaries. Treasure, yes, again of sorts, because it is what's motivating our culprit, seeking smuggled animal furs. It's a treasure. Our setting is a whale watching and fishing island community. The location is Washington, more specifically the San Juan Islands. And there are four suspects. And then the final one is number 10, The Secret of Shadow Ranch. Nancy is invited to spend a holiday with Bess and George and their relatives who own Shadow Ranch. Nancy learns of a phantom horse and of Dirk Valentine's hidden treasure. And this one is the first game that's based on a hardcover novel. It's number five. The Secret of Shadow Ranch. Our mystery is sabotage and haunting. Treasure, oh heck yes there is. Our setting is a ranch and sort of the surrounding community. It is located in Arizona and to no one's surprise we have four suspects. So there we go. There's sort of our main rundown of the 10 games and I'm just going to do a bit of a further breakdown of sort of what's already been covered on each game. So in case you needed to know all of these games take place in the United States of America. That will change by the time I do the next recap for the next 10 games. It actually changed with the very next game, which was very exciting at the time. So then looking at the physical characters, eight of the 10 games have four physical characters, and that's pretty standard for the series. We have two exceptions. So we have one game which has five physical characters. That is Stay Tuned for Danger. And then one game with three characters, physical characters to be more accurate, and that is Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake. Quickly looking at the books, so three of the ten are based on case files, six are based on the digest paperbacks, and one is based on a hardcover. And of those games, one is actually based on two stories. Again, that's Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake. Both stories come from the paperback series, and then the remaining nine are based on a single novel. And then looking at the mysteries, and we're going to get numbers that don't actually add up to 10 because some games have more than one. So there's a lot of repetition, which is not a bad thing. So we have one mystery that is a murder, one where it's threats against a person, and that includes attempted murder. Four of the games involve a haunting at some point. Four of them also involve sabotage. One is a mystery that includes vandalism. I do consider vandalism separate from sabotage. Uh, and that, in case you're curious, is Treasure in the Royal Tower, Vandalism in the Library. Uh, and then four, again, four of the games involve mystery um, as a theft. And then one of them is a kidnapping. And then again, that treasure hunt count. Six of the first ten games involve a treasure hunt. That's what's motivating the culprit, is they are seeking something of value. So I thought that was really interesting and thought it was nice to be able to wrap it up this way. All right, so that's the end of the dry stuff. Well, 
in my opinion, the end of the dry stuff. I wanted to quickly go over educational elements. And this is one of the things that I used to really like about the Nancy Drew games. And when it's still present, I still like it. I just found it was um, less apparent in later games. So just quickly going through these. So secrets can kill. We learn how to use braille, sort of a bit of the language. We don't become proficient in it, but we learn a bit about it, as well as deciphering coded messages. There are a whole bunch of messages throughout the school and the diner. So I thought that was really cool and worth noting as an educational element. As far as Stay Tuned for Danger is concerned, um, I could only put deciphering coded messages. I can't think of any other educational element included in this game. And I feel like this was a massively missed opportunity because you're on a film set and there's a lot of stuff you can learn about that scene. So unfortunately, that, as far as I could tell, was never included in the game. So I'm sticking with deciphering coded messages. <laughs> For a message in a haunted mansion, uh, we learn about the great earthquake and piano notes, how to play piano a little bit. For Treasure in the Royal Tower, it's all about French history and the French language, which is pretty darn cool. For the final scene, we learn about Harry Houdini and the act of illusions, which is really fascinating. Secret of the Scarlet Hand, our uh, educational elements are obviously Mayan history, and I also wanted to include Morse code because we do use that. Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake, a uh, few here, we've got Roman numerals, uh, birds, so we're looking for birds hearing their calls and um, being able to figure out a, a bird based on its coloring, its plumage. And then a little bit about animal born diseases. <laughs> I mean, we don't go into detail about it, but there's a fact sheet at uh, the ranger station. So you do learn about that. <laughs> For the haunted carousel, we learn about stenography or shorthand, as it's often referred. We learn how to play the harmonica, so I put harmonica notes, and a wee bit about ohms. That's when we're fixing that card reader. For danger on Deception Island, we learn about cetaceans. This we're, this time, um, or pardon me, this location of Whale World. We learn a lot about whales. Uh, we learn about the phonetic alphabet, and of course Morse code again. And then finally, a secret of Shadow Ranch. We learn about how to determine when a vegetable is ripe. We learn about the history of petroglyphs and, of course, a whole bunch of horse facts. So there we go. That's sort of a quick little wrap of our educational elements for the first 10 games. And from here, we're going to talk about, or I'm going to just quickly note, the locations of the games that I've visited. Because for me, this is always cool. Um, I love to travel and I really enjoy being able to point out in films and in these games uh, the places I've been to. I, I do it all the time. For me it's just kind of fun to say hey I've been there. <laughs> so there aren't many for the first 10 games because they're all based in the states. Uh, when Nancy goes across the ocean my count goes up. So for Secrets Can Kill set in Florida yes I've been there. Spent my entire time at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter because I am a super nerd. For Stay Tuned for Danger in New York, no, I've never been. Kind of close, but I've never actually been there. Message in Haunted Mansion, California, yes, I haven't spent a great deal of time there. I've flown in and out of the airport in LA a couple of times and did some training for two weeks uh, not far from Los Angeles. Uh, Treasure in the Royal Tower, Wisconsin, no, I've never been to Wisconsin, but I'd really like to. I feel like that would be a place that... Um, that I could enjoy as far as the wilderness and sort of the landscape. For the final scene, Missouri. Nope, never been. Secret of the Scarlet Hand is set in Washington, D.C. and I've never been there. <laughs> Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake in Pennsylvania. Nope, I haven't been there either. <laughs> the Haunted Carousel, New Jersey. No, I almost flew into Newark uh, when I was going to Japan, which didn't make any sense and we got our flight changed. Um, so came close, but didn't happen. And then Danger on Deception Island set in Washington. No, again, I've been really close. I've been to Vancouver Island, kind of sailed through a bunch of islands. Haven't been to the San Juan Islands, though. So, nope, can't check off, check off anything there. And then finally, I get a yes again. Secret of Shadow Ranch is set in Arizona. And yes, I have been there. So, of the first 10 games, I've been to three of their locations. As already noted, I know that number is going to go up when Nancy does some international travel, because that's what I do a lot of. <laughs> okay, and now for me, the really fun stuff, going over some of my favorites. So all these different elements. 
Uh, I'm going to start by ranking the games worst to best. This is by no means hard and fast rules. There's a lot of fluidity as far as where the games rank, uh, with minor exceptions. Uh, the actual worst and the actual best, those are pretty firm. So my least favorite game is Stay Tuned for Danger. It's done well. It follows the story, I think, the, the novel story, that is, in a really good way. But I find it unsettling. I've never liked this game. It just gives me the heebie-jeebies. So it gets placed in number 10. <laughs> right after that is Secrets Can Kill. I do love this game. It's the first game I ever played. The only reason it's ranked number nine is because I like the other games slightly better. So I, I don't actually have any issues with this game. I know a lot of people do. I'm not one of them. So in eighth place, I've put The Haunted Carousel. Again, mostly because there are other games that I like more. I really enjoy that this is a shorter game. It's one I like to play when I do want something quick. Uh, seventh place, put Danger on Deception Island. I love that setting. I love being on the coast. I've said this before, I'm pretty sure anyways, it's sort of like my second home. So I do really enjoy that game, despite being put in the seventh spot. <laughs> uh, number six is Ghost Dogs and Moon Lake. I love all the outdoor time that we have there. That just brings me such joy. Now these ones are a little bit more firm for the top five. So Secret of the Scarlet Hand. Love this game, despite how much I don't actually care about history. I love museums. I really love all the detail that was put in to Beach Hill Museum. It's one of my favorite things about any game. So, and it's got a fantastic soundtrack. And then the final scene, similar reasons. I love all the detail. I just would love to explore the Royal Palladium if it was real. Great soundtrack as well. And I love the three day setting. It was just so cool. The third one is The Secret of Shadow Ranch. Also, as I've said, I should have been born and raised on a ranch or farm. It also feels like home to me. <laughs> a great soundtrack. I love the romantic storyline and this treasure hunt. It's just superb. The second place is Message in a Haunted Mansion. This is the second game I ever played. I love the setup. I love the storyline. I love the the eerie sound effects. It's just superb. Um, and this is pretty firm as being my second favorite game. And top is definitely Treasure in the Royal Tower. I'm a winter baby. I love all the snow. I love the castle, all the dead ends. It's just great. I mean, there's nothing for me to to um, say Ugh, about. <laughs> it's, it's a great game. So that's my ranking for you. Next, I'm going to move on to favorite characters. And <laughs> this is primarily about the physical characters. So I'm going to just rank um, or just note my favorite character from each game, my overall favorite character, and also my favorite culprit. So again, we're just going to go in order. Uh, Secrets Can Kill, this was sort of a tough one. It was tied between Hal and Connie, but I've gone with Hal. And that's primarily because of the lengths that he goes to. I mean, he and Connie both make mistakes, but I feel that Hal's is more serious. And I sort of feel for him a little bit more than Connie. And that's really why he's my favorite of that uh, that group of students. Stay tuned for danger. Millie Strathorn is my favorite because she's just nutty. <laughs> she is a little wacky and entertaining. For a message in a haunted match, and this was a close one to um, Abby and Charlie. Sort of get my tall votes, but Abby, just because she kind of stood out in terms of what she was interested in, um, you know, a little quirky, but also I love the sound she makes when she's talking about Charlie here. Ugh, how much she hates him. Hates a strong word, how much she doesn't trust him. But uh, that's sort of why Abby gets my vote. Treasure in the Royal Tower is Professor Beatrice Hotchkiss. Also just wacky, nutty, fantastic. One of the best characters made from the entire series. So she's she's just great. There's nothing wrong about her. Uh, the final scene, Joseph Hughes. Uh, it was sort of hard to pick between him and Nick. Um, but just because of his background and his complexities, and because I didn't really consider him a suspect, that's why Joseph gets my vote for the final scene. For Secret of the Scarlet Hand, Henrik van der Heulen, I mean, there's no question about this. I just really like him. I found him rather fascinating. I was intrigued by his speech. That probably sounds like a weird thing, but that's the case. <laughs> and I really liked his role. I really liked his job and just found him overall very fascinating. For Ghost Dogs and Moon Lake, Emily is my favorite uh, partly because of her speech, um, just her, her strong accent and made her a bit more unique because of that. And also the way she spoke about other people, not necessarily a nice thing, but 
it stood out and she really had her own characteristics. So that's why she's my favorite character from that game. But Vivian Whitmore and Eustacia Andropov would be the winners if I wasn't looking at physical characters. Their conversations on the phone with Nancy are fantastic. <laughs> I just think they are a hoot and I would love it if they somehow came back. I, it wouldn't be realistic and I don't know that I would actually like it if they came back at this point so late in the series. But Eustacia Andropov was just a great surprise and Vivian, I don't know, she just made me happy. She's kind of funny. <laughs> so they, they get my second vote for Ghost Dogs and Moonlight. <laughs> And then for the Haunted Carousel, Harlan Bishop, and that was a pretty easy one, and because of his background and me feeling sympathetic is sort of one of the, the big ways that I'm going to fall for a character and really uh, empathize with them, but it's also why I like them so much, is being able to empathize for them and not be annoyed by them. <laughs> yeah, and I, I like Harlan's attempts to turn his life around and to get a second chance, and he's very keen to do the right thing. And I think it's a great story, just him, um, him trying to, you know, uh, make up for his mistakes, basically. For Day Drawn Deception Island, Jenna Devlin, I just really liked her. Um, she's a little bit spunky. And based on her coloring, I would say, and I don't want that to sound weird, but, and it's not right, outright stated, but I believe she's supposed to be of Indigenous descent, which I really appreciate. You know, she's not pasty white like Katie is or like I am. <laughs> so I like the diversity and it's appropriate. So that's one of the reasons I really like Jenna in that game. Just she, she was supposed to be there is really the way I feel about her. And then for Secret of Shadow Ranch, Dave Gregory, mostly because I had a crush on him when this game first came out. And I know I'm not the only one. <laughs> but again, there's there's the ability to empathize with him and sort of his storyline. And he's very sweet. He's not irritating um, like some of the others. He's not a loudmouth. He's not a chatterbox. Um, I sort of like that he does keep to himself. Um, he is... Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe him, but he's a bit reserved. You know, and um, yeah, again, that storyline, his background, I find really interesting. So with all that said, who is my favorite character from the top or the first 10 games? Professor Beatrice Hotch Hotchkiss, because she's just fantastic. But if I could choose someone who's not a physical character, then obviously Eustacia and drop off because she's a hoot. She was great in her one phone call in the final scene. She was even better in her one phone call in Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake. So she's also my winner. <laughs> and then as far as a favorite culprit... This is probably not too surprising as Joseph Hughes. Uh, again, the complexity of, of his character, not actually suspecting him and the lengths he went to to try to save his home. That's what the theater is. It was, it was his home. And the things that drive a person to do bad things is it's quite interesting and can be really heartbreaking. So I really, really appreciated having Joseph as the villain in the final scene and from the first 10 games he is my favorite culprit of, of them all okay moving away from characters and now looking at the cover art so i love the message in haunted mansion cover art it just draws me in it really feels exciting with the lightning coming down it feels quite spooky in a good way so that's always been one of my favorite uh, pieces of art for the um for the game covers and then my second one is the secret of shadow ranch cover art uh, it's it's a bit more bold compared with Message in a Haunted Mansion, and I feel like there's a lot going on. Our Phantom Horse really stands out. And I love the coloring to it. Um, it just draws me in as well. So not to say that I don't like any of the other cover art. It's just these are the two that sort of stand out the most from the first 10 games. Moving away from that, and now <laughs> going to go over some of my favorite lines from the games. And goodness me, I, it's going to be weird trying to read these lines, especially the third set. So I've got three, just my top three that I've set up here for us. So the first one is, you're asking the wrong amnesiac. Henrik van der Heeren says this in Secret of the Scarlet Hand. I think this line a lot of the time. I don't say it out loud because people won't get it. But if I'm asked something and I don't know the answer, this is what my brain starts saying. It's, 
you're asking the wrong amnesiac. Sorry, guys, I don't know. But it's one of my favorite lines, and I use it all the time in my head. <laughs> and I think I say it to my sister, because she would kind of get it. Uh, my next <laughs> set of favorite lines is, oh, where's my brain? And both Sally McDonald and Vivian Whitmore from Ghost Dogs and Moonlight say a variation of this. Sally doesn't actually say the O, she just says, where's my brain? Whereas Vivian says, oh, where is my brain? So I really like the reuse of that line, and I like that line. It's entertaining. And then the final set of lines, it's it's a bit, it's a piece of conversation. It also comes from Ghost Dogs and Moon Lake, and it's one of the best things ever written, in my opinion. <laughs> it's, Nancy Drew, the Snoopy one. You're not dead yet? Uh, no. Most people, I talk to them one day, next day, they are dead. It is an old age thing. The wonderful Eustacia and drop off, ladies and gentlemen. I can't do a good impression of her, unfortunately. I can't quite get the depth and raspiness of her voice, but man alive, that is one of my favorite pieces of dialogue. Not one of them. It is my favorite piece of dialogue from all of the games. It just, it made me laugh the first time and every subsequent time I've played the game. It puts a big smile on my face. So those are my favorite lines. And then I just wanted to quickly go, go over favorite soundtracks. Just my top three. Um, I love the soundtrack for the final scene. It comes on, like just pops into my head randomly quite frequently. Also, Secret of the Scarlet Hand has a fantastic soundtrack. This is one I've listened to at work many, many times. Same with The Secret of Shadow Ranch. This, just the tunes from this come into my head all the time. And obviously while I was playing the game, it was hard to resist humming and singing along with it. So great soundtracks. Uh, so the other games also have some really great soundtracks as well. But these are the, the three standouts from the first 10. So continuing on, let's look at puzzles and activities. Uh, I've sort of given it this double header because one of the activities... Well, one of the things is an activity. It's not actually a puzzle, and I didn't want a single slide just for it. So this is going to cover a couple of things. So the first one is slider puzzles, which we get in both Secrets Can Kill and Message in a Haunted Mansion. I love a good slider puzzle, which is funny because as a kid, I hated them. I had a very simple 3x3 three three slider puzzle that I messed up for a really long time and couldn't figure it out. And I was distraught, like absolutely devastated, thought I'm never going to get this beautiful slider puzzle back into uh, the image it was supposed to be. And I was determined to get it back. And I taught myself how to do slider puzzles, like all the tricks to them. So I now love them. <laughs> Hated them when I was really young. But once I figured it out, figured out how to do them, I, I now love them. I think they're great. So obviously some of my favorite activities to do in the games. I also love this brief Towers of Hanoi puzzle that we get to do in Stay Tuned for Danger. This is also something where I've figured out how to solve them so it's actually really easy but I enjoy it it doesn't necessarily have to be difficult for me to have fun with the task so that's one of my favorites the next thing as far as puzzles go it's not a specific puzzle but it's a group of things and it's from ghost dogs of moon like it's all the Roman numeral Roman I think I said Roman <laughs> Roman numeral puzzles because everything is connected in ghost dogs of moon like you've got the Roman numerals coming up in the end, but also how they're associated with the dogs and the collars of the dogs and the colors of the collars of the dogs also associated with the first letters of their name. Like I just love how it's all interconnected and it's it's the series of puzzles that makes this game really strong. It's one of the highlights of this game. It's just done beautifully. I love how well thought out that was. I don't think there's anything comparable to that, to this rather in any of the other games. So I'll really have to think about that, but I, off the top of my head, I can't imagine that there is another game with a series of puzzles done so masterfully as this one. And then the final thing is, of course, the activity that's not a puzzle, and it's spying on suspects, which we get to do in Message in a Haunted Mansion and Treasure in the Royal Tower. I just love the inclusion of this. You know, Nancy has to try not to get caught. She has to be in there at the right moment. It's not something that can just happen at any time, or at least message in a hot dimension, you really have to plan it. But I really liked being able to be sort of a snoop and properly hiding and 
gathering information when when there's another person there and they have no idea you're there. For me, that really made me feel like a detective. So I really, really wanted to point that out. So those are my favorite puzzles and activities. And then uh, just going over sort of favorite moment. And of course, it's the return of Eustacia and Dropov. Because why wouldn't it be? <laughs> just her sudden appearance on the telephone in Ghost Dogs and Moon Lake. It's just one of the greatest things ever. No, once again, it is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> it's not one of, it just is. So favorite moment is, uh, yeah, this unexpected conversation with Eustacia. Short-lived as it may be. It, it's just, it's brilliant. <laughs> and then from there, I'm just going to go over some of my favorite storylines. So Treasure in the Royal Tower is on this list because I love that Nancy's snowed in. I love the location. She's on this ski hill and then all this French history. I also love the inclusion of all the dead end passages. It's just so cool. And then learning that there's, you know, this potential treasure and trying to get into this tower. It's, I just really wanted to be a sleuth playing this game. So I just love that storyline. Another superb one is Secret of the Scarlet Hand. I like, again, sort of this history tie with these first two. Again, for someone who doesn't like history, they wind up being some of my favorite games. Uh, but I love all the all the detail that's put in. I love the museum in particular. But I like that we're sort of following a series of thefts that don't actually start at Beach Hill. And we learn that there's sort of a bigger, bigger plot at play. So I really, really enjoy this storyline. Uh, Danger on Deception Island, again, um, pulling at, pulling at something a little different. Um, just this, this motivate motivation. Pardon me, I'm, I'm losing all my words. The motivation of our culprit here, of trying to recover these smuggled animal furs, it's the smuggling that intrigues me, and this also is sort of ties into Secret of the Scarlet Hand, where we've we've got art and history. Um, it's not it's not gold, but it's something else still of value, and I really appreciate that storyline. And I I like sort of this mystery around the whole island. If we're going back to Danger on Deception Island, and Hilda and her role in trying to figure out what's going on with some distance and sort of enlisting Nancy's help. Oh, there's just a whole lot that I really like about the storyline, and of course, again, because it's on the coast where I've spent a lot of my time. Uh, I just really like it for that reason. And then finally, The Secret of Shadow Ranch, my other home. Apparently I have a bunch of homes, the coast, a ranch, and then where I actually grew up. And I'm a snow baby, so, so many. Uh, but I love the romantic storyline. I love the treasure hunt. I like that we know that that's what we're seeking, and it's very exciting. I like all the activities. I love the upbeat music and trying to figure out what's going on at the ranch and assuming it's related to this treasure hunt. It just makes for a great story. So those are just some of my favorite storylines. And there's a lot of diversity in the first 10 games, so it's hard to pick. And I thought these are going to be the ones that I point out because there are uh, some strong differences uh, from them with relation to the other games. And then I want to talk about book to game adaptations. And I'm looking at these in two different ways. So my favorite adaptation in terms of where the novel was really good, so the best story and how like, the game is most similar to that story, so to the source material. There are two, and there are no questions about them. Treasure in the Royal Tower and Secret of Shadow Ranch. The games are almost identical in some ways <laughs> with the actual books, and the stories are strong, the novels are strong, and the games are strong. So those are no question my favorite book-to-game adaptations in terms of best stories and most similar stories, uh, game stories to books. And then I also wanted to look at best or favorite book to game adapt adaptation in terms of improvement to the source material because some of the games are based on books where reading the books on their own I wasn't that impressed. I thought they were duds but the games were really really good so what her interactive did was really impressive so here I'm just going to point out Message in a Haunted Mansion like, like the story is fine but the game is just amazing. Secret of the Scarlet Hand I mean there are a lot of similarities although characters sort of swap roles but it wasn't one of my favorite reads, but it's one of my favorite games. And same thing with The Haunted Carousel. Didn't care for the book, like, at all. I really didn't feel all that impressed and don't know why Interactive, in some ways, thought of turning that into a game. 
but they did such a marvelous job. It is such a good game. So I really wanted to point out sort of these differences in how I could figure out some favorites for book to game adaptations. Okay, continuing on, uh, favorite locations. So I'm looking at this in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first, just locations in general. This is not in terms of city or state, but actually of the creative space. So first one off the bat is the final scene. I just love the Royal Palladium just as a location. This theater was done really, really well. I've said in my mod interview, if, if that was a real place, I would love to go there and explore it. I just find it really intriguing. I think it would be such a cool building to explore and have adventures in. A close second is Treasure in the Royal Tower because again it's on a, a ski hill and I just love that snowy setting and I love the castle. It's just done so well. Again all these passageways with dead ends and trying to get into the tower. It's just so wonderfully created. And then of course, I mean this should, shouldn't come as a surprise at this point, Secret of Shadow Ranch. Love the ranch. Um, I wish we could have seen a little bit more of the ranch house. Um, but I loved the garden. I loved being able to ride around. It's just, it was so cool. I really liked the, the just the, the whole series of uh, places that her interactive created for the Secret of Shadow Ranch. And then the other thing I'm looking at is actually my favorite room from all of the games. And might surprise you, it's not from any of those three. It's actually Nancy's guest room in Message in a Haunted Mansion. There's something about the detail and... The color, it's so rich, and I loved going into that space, plus the change in music when you enter the room. And you get this with the earliest of games, and I guess some of the later ones, but it's not as, not as, um, what's the word I want? Obvious, I guess. But whenever you enter a different room, the music changes, and I found that was particularly apparent with Message in a Haunted Mansion, and in particular when going into Nancy's room. So this room really stands out for a few reasons. Because of the way it's designed, but, be all, but also because of the musical change when you enter that setting. So just love it. It's so good. So next on my list, we're sort of reaching the end. Uh, my favorite endings. So again, this is by no means um, hard and fast. These are the only endings I like. It's just some of the endings I'm pointing out and for a couple different reasons. So the first one is Message in a Haunted Mansion. I really like that you have to have paid attention in this game to the squeaking stairs and the rope for the chandelier. If you hadn't been aware of those early on, you might not know how to catch the culprit. I don't actually like that we send a chandelier crashing down on the culprit. Like that can do a lot of damage. It could kill him. That's the only thing that's a little iffy about that. But for me, the thing I really like about this is having had to have paid attention. Details are important. The next one I want to point out is Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake. Um, I just really like how we're in a very confined place when we're with our culprit, and you have to really be on your toes to realize I'm not going out through the one obvious door. If I look down, I can go through the sewers, and you wind up getting behind the culprit and scurrying away and locking them in. So again, you're you're not um, you're not going through anything super obvious. You, you really have to be aware of your space. So really like the ending because of that. Uh, the Haunted Carousel, not the like the very ending. Um, that's not why I like this one. It's the early part of the ending, which sounds really confusing. So I will try to explain. I like the confrontation when we first speak with a car with our culprit. We actually have this option of how to respond. Like we, we often have conversations and some lines we get to say, we might be able to pick a slew of them and maybe not all of them. With this one, we have the jewels that we picked up in the previous room and we're given an option. of Do we throw them at the culprit or do we just keep them? Do we like, do we tell them about them? Yes. We have a choice that we actually get to make toward the end of this game. And part of this is having paid attention. If you read Nancy's emails, you sort of learn about this. I didn't do this when I first played the game. I picked the wrong option. But I like that we have this option right at the end, which is really cool. And we don't really see that again, I don't think. Not that that I can recall. So that's what I really like about the ending here. It's not actually about how we, you know, capture the culprit. It's how we distract the culprit and have a choice 
uh, that we, we are an active participant right till the end. And then the last one is Danger on Deception Island. And uh, this is sort of the whole ending before we realize we're at the ending. There's, there's a lot of really great things about this one. So I like that we think we know who the culprit is and we are acting as though we're correct and we go seek help. We sneak aboard this giant freighter and we have to hide. Again, we're being aware of our surroundings. Nancy has to move around quite carefully. She doesn't just get to walk over to the stairs, you know, all, no obstacles. She has a set of obstacles and more than one. So I really like that you have to be aware and know how to hide Again, being aware of your surroundings. And then I like we get down to where we think the culprit is only to, to discover our culprit is a victim. So we were wrong, or at least I know I was wrong. I was completely mistaken. So I really like that ending. I was also super excited because when this game came out, or rather shortly before the game came out, I remember posting on, I think it was called the Game Suggestion Board, that I really wanted Nancy's host to be the culprit. And I thought they had done that in this game. I thought, yes, they listened to my suggestion. Her interactive has made the person who Nancy's been asked to visit the bad guy. They didn't actually. So I really liked, you know, being wrong and having been misled and sort of that whole sequence. So a really good ending because of all those, all these different little elements before we get to the actual culprit. So again, these are just some examples of the great endings. Um, and they just had me some of my favorites that I wanted to point out. And, and then I wanted to talk about some of my favorite memories. So these are not necessarily things that other people would have experienced. These are my own personal memories that I associate with the top 10 games. Not top 10, but the first 10. And um, so I've just picked some for each of the games. And I thought, eh, it might be fun to share these. <laughs> so for Secrets Can Kill, this was my first game. So that's obviously a strong memory. I also remember terrorizing my friend with the explosions in this game. So I had played it, I don't know how many times, and I had a friend come over. And I didn't tell her about everything that happens in the game. I thought it was important that she figure it out for herself, obviously. And we were in the diner, and she took the bolt cutters. And I didn't think I had to tell her that you need to replace them. Learning experiences are important. I do remember scooting back from the computer and her leaving the kitchen and an explosion and her freaking out and me laughing like an evil friend. <laughs> so it's a terrible thing to do, but it's it's a strong memory I have. And the irony of this is I couldn't do this on my own. I mean, the kitchen was fine, but in the boiler room, I used to ha always have to get my brother to save me because I didn't want it to explode because I wasn't fast enough. So, you know, some irony there. <laughs> uh, stay tuned for danger. Again, not my, not my favorite game. It's my least favorite of the first 10. So my memory about it is actually about writing an alternate ending and having to remind myself that my version is not the real version. For a message in a haunted mansion, one of my memories about this is when I first got the game. I remember sitting at the eating bar having breakfast. This was before school one morning and I was super groggy. And my mom came up to me and said something along the lines of, well, if you're not going to thank me, then I'm going to give it back. I was like, what? I don't understand. I'm just eating porridge. And I was very confused. And lo and behold, like just a matter of centimeters from my bowl was message in a haunted mansion. I hadn't even noticed it. I was that tired and I was quite quick to thank her and felt so stupid for having not seen it. It felt kind of bad, but mostly I just felt dumb and blind. And uh, another memory is terrorizing my sister. <laughs> she was terrified. Uh, she was sitting with me as I played the game once. And when Nancy goes up the stairs at one point, you hear the sound effect of, I see you. Freaked her out, still does. I asked her, this was many months ago when I was sort of thinking about doing these videos. I gave her the list of all the games and said, just tell me the first things that come to mind. And as soon as I said message in hot dimension, she's like, oh, I see you. I'm terrified. So yes, that's uh, one of my memories from that game. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Treasure in the Royal Tower, um, RAM. Back when we had to worry about RAM, when I got this game, our computer didn't have enough RAM and I couldn't play it right away. It was really upsetting. And beyond that, I just loved the whole game. The final scene also ran. I got it at the same time as Treasure in the Royal Tower. So again, I couldn't play it right away. <laughs> and uh, that was really disappointing. And another big memory about it is that I discovered the message boards because of this game. Because I got stuck 
trying to, or not knowing that I had to find gum. So strong memory. And then of course, you know, what happened with the discovering the message board is eventually becoming a mod. So uh, there's, there's some strong stuff there. For Secret of the Scarlet Hand, one of my main memories is the banner. So when I first joined the message board, and the message board looked different than it does now, but there used to be a banner at the top that would change uh, with the upcoming game. So when I first joined, it was ad it was an advertisement for Secret of the Scarlet Hand. And then I also have this, or had rather, this love-hate relationship with the game. I really liked it when I first played it. The second or third time, I hated it and couldn't figure out why anyone enjoyed the game. Didn't play it for ages. Picked it up one day and was like, oh, hot dang, I love this game. Why did I not play it? So that was really weird. Um, but yeah, so it's one of the games I now love the most and has a fantastic soundtrack. One of my all-time favorites. Uh, with respect to Ghost Dogs Moon Lake, um, anticipating my friend's frantic call. So I loaned this game along with the final scene to a friend. Not the same one I terrorized with explosions, but a different friend. I do somehow have more than one despite my evilness. Uh, but I had loaned the game to her and she had called me one weekend because she was playing Ghost Dogs Moon Lake. She couldn't find the hawk. And so I sort of told her, you know, what you have to do in order to find the hawk. And for those who are well versed in this game, you know what happens after you take a photo of the hawk. I did not forewarn her, but I remember hanging up the call and an evil grin came on my face and telling my dad, <laughs> she's going to call back soon. And sure enough, she did. So that's one of my strongest memories with Ghost Dogs and Moon Lake, anticipating my friend freaking out over what was going to happen after her previous phone call. Uh, for the Haunted Carousel, the big thing for me was taking days to pick up the game. I'd ordered it from EB Games uh, in a different town than where I live and had a family friend pick it up when they were in the city. And then I just didn't pick it up from her right away, even though her house was just a few minutes, like a few minutes walk from where I lived, which was really dumb. I don't know why I wasn't more keen to go pick up the game. And of course, accidentally winning. I didn't mean to um, actually solve the game in the way that I did. It was a total fluke. Clicked in a place I didn't mean to or wasn't aware of what I was clicking on and just made a sign, whack a culprit, and that was the end. So yeah, that stands out. For Danger on Deception Island, ugh, how much I hated clamming. This is because I didn't realize you get clams in more than one place. Yeah, I was stuck for a really long time because I couldn't find all the clams because I kept going to the same place. And then uh, going to Cadboro Bay, oh, when, when I lived on the island, I went to visit a friend. And that was where we were going to meet. So I got there first. And I remember sort of sitting or standing there and thinking, I'm just going to keep an eye out for Caddy. I feel like I'm in a Nancy Drew game. <laughs> and then for Secret of Shadow Ranch, uh, there's actually a lot here. Um, big thing was knowledge of the story before the game came out. So when the game title was revealed, when we knew this was going to be the next game, I had just read the book and I was like, no, I know the story. I know who the culprit is, assuming her interactive doesn't change that. And they didn't. And we used to have these really cool product pages with lots of different things you could look at on the message board. So that was the first time I really jumped into that and was like, I already know the story. And, and I didn't look at the product pages ahead of time previously because I didn't want things to be spoiled. It was more fun to just get the game and uh, have everything be new. So that changed with uh, Secret of, of Shadow Ranch because I kind of knew everything already to some degree. Obviously not every single detail, didn't know what the puzzles were going to be. Um, but had a lot of fun exploring the product pages. Um, I also had a love-hate-love -love relationship like I did with Secret of the Scarlet Hand. Really liked the game when it first came out, and then was really quite iffy about it and didn't understand why people loved it. And now I love it. So it, it, I don't know why preference changes or did a lot back then. It also has a superb soundtrack. Uh, another big memory was excitement over petroglyphs and cliff dwellings because I went to some of the southern states um, uh, spring break one year, my dad had taken my siblings and me and we were so excited to see petroglyphs because like, I know about these from Nancy Drew. I'm so excited to see these in real life. Um, and my dad talks about this all the time and I've got lots of photos <laughs> that I took of petroglyphs and there, there's a photo of me taking photos of petroglyphs. That's how, how big a deal it was. And, um, going to Mesa Verde was just super exciting to, to actually see real life cliff dwellings was super cool. And again, associating that with the Secret of Shadow Ranch.
And then the final thing is becoming a moderator. I, I was invited to join the mod team that summer that this game came out. So really powerful memory there. Lots of history associated with that. Uh, yeah, so those are my uh, my memories, my favorite memories associated with the first 10 games of the Nancy Drew series. So the last thing I want to do is go over what I'm calling a special topic. So I th thought that with each recap video I do, so again, I'm just going to do this for every 10 games. So there will only be three of them, uh, maybe a fourth if I'm doing all of them, all, all of the games, uh, not just in batches of 10. And I wanted to do special topics, so I would talk about something different each time. And the big one that often comes up for me that I think about is dialogue. So the game dialogue has changed a lot in the many, many years that Her Interactive has been producing the Nancy Drew games. And it's not necessarily been changing for the better. And this really comes up, or really came up, um, in terms of choices. Uh, so Nancy used to get a whole bunch of choices for how to respond. And I've put in the screenshot from the final scene. This is one of the rare times where we get three options. It was often two, if we were given options at all. And of course, in the early games, we were always given options. But so we've got um, these three different responses that we can give to Joseph. And none of them are changing the topic. It's all a different way to respond to a single thing with presumably about the same outcome like with what he's going to say back to us so we can ask, how can you be sure? Or you're suggesting it must be one of these people. Are you counting yourself as a suspect? So these are all valid responses to whatever Joseph had said before without actually changing the topic. Again, we, we were given choice. We were given options to make choices. There's a lot of autonomy and feeling like we were playing the role of Nancy. We were taking the lead by being able to make a choice from a selection of options. In later games, you're maybe following Nancy because you're not actually given choices. And I don't even know if I'd say you're following. You're, you're behind her. The, the computer game, the program is leading and all we're doing is clicking. Because we don't actually have a choice. We have to select everything that's on the screen in later games. And there's no flow. The flow is really bad. Um, which I'll get into more detail later on, but I don't know why the choices really got cut from the games. I've been writing just for fun, um, my own computer game, uh, f like a Nancy Drew one and of, of a story that I thought would be interesting. And the beginning is a whole bunch of dialogue, um, it's sort of reminiscent of Secret of the Scarlet Hand, as well as White Wolf of Icicle Creek, with just the way the, the intro is in my head. And so the way I've written everything out, I've done all of the if this, then that options. And if, if you don't understand what that is, it's basically, you, you've got, you've got some options. So if you pick this option, what other options come up? If you had selected the other option, what options would come up? And you go through all these different possible iterations and your dialogue options, the way I've written it, they change, they adapt based on your earlier choices. And that was really fun. It was a great exercise. And I'd highly encourage everyone to do that. If, if this is something you're curious about, even if it's not related to your job or, or anything in your real life, just as an exercise to really appreciate what it takes to do this but also the fun there is in doing that and the importance of these if then then that's and how that influences and uh, overall affects the outcome of the quality of the game. So her interactive used to do these all the time and, and you would see it in uh, continue with the if this then that some of the dialogue would change depending on what your choice was. It wasn't always the same response regardless of what thing you said there were some variations, which was great. And you might have a piece of additional dialogue and the rest is the same as whatever other choice you could have made. But that was great. There was, I'm trying to think of the best way to put it, but things flowed really well. Um, it felt very realistic. It wasn't stilted. It wasn't, this has to be the dialogue. Um, things were phrased uh, or the emphasis by the voice actors took into account the options so th it was really powerful these these options we had and our ability to make choices 
in our conversations with characters. And it's just lacking. It's been lacking for years with the later games. With that said, I did see it starting to come back in Sea of Darkness. I was really, really thrilled and surprised when I realized, oh, I have a choice here. I actually have a choice. It's not I'm just going through every option because I have to. But I actually am given options for how to respond to this one piece of dialogue. Um, Because so often it was just you had one thing to say or you would immediately jump into a different topic and would break the flow. Like Again, the flow was really affected. Um, The next thing I'll talk about is the grammar. I'm just going to be really quick about this. The early games, like the first game for sure, I, I was very aware of this. Nancy's grammar was perfect and I love it. And I don't know if this is just because the education systems are so different in the States versus Canada. I mean, our education education system was, and granted, it's it's, it's interesting right now. Um, but we were really big about this stuff. And it was important. And maybe this is also a societal thing. But we learn grammar rules for a reason. And I don't know why they weren't implemented in the games when they used to be. Nazi had perfect grammar or very near perfect grammar in the early games and I understood what she was saying saying and the lack of it in later games it just sounds lazy and again these games are meant to be educational tools I pointed out some of the educational elements already but that was another part of it that was just sort of included went without saying was we were things were written properly there weren't all these shortcuts so I ugh. I don't like the newer games because they lack proper grammar. Um, Yeah, again, these are educational tools. And things should be written the way we are taught, the way we're we're learning in school. Kids are at the age when they're playing these games that they're learning all these rules. The games, the newer games are sort of counteracting what they're being taught in school. And it doesn't make any sense to me. Anyhow, the last thing I want to talk about is weird dialogue. And this is partly with regard to flow. Again, as I said, when we were given choices, we were still on a particular topic. With the later games, you might have been talking about something really heavy, quite serious. And then your dialogue, you would get a slew of different options. And Nancy might suddenly be bright and cheery. Or what what she was asking was already kind of answered in an earlier conversation. Just this lack of flow, the dialogue is really strange. And even some of the characters and just the words and overall sentences are super weird. And I'm I'm thinking primarily of the Shattered Medallion, where, yeah, like the characters were, it's as though they were supposed to be weird and wacky or sounded like they were really wise in their strange way of presenting their thoughts. And it was overdone and was not effective in any way. I it just made these characters really annoying for me. So, yeah, a lot of weird dialogue. Like, it just went really downhill in the later games. Top, again, I keep saying top ten. The first ten games were superb with regard to dialogue in all these respects and having options for us to make choices and to take the lead. Grammar, so following with what people were being taught in school while they're the age that they're learning all this. And the way we're supposed to talk in life to help us understand each other. And again, this weird dialogue where things just don't flow or people, the characters rather, are saying really strange things and it's just bizarre and irritating. So in general terms, I do believe the earliest of games had the strongest dialogue. I mean, there's really no question about that. And the games progressively deteriorated in the area of dialogue as the years went on, which is really unfortunate. So I'm kind of leaving that at sort of a depressing note, but that's that's the way it is, I'm afraid. Uh, but there we go. That's my recap of the first 10 games. Again, Secrets Can Kill, Stay Tuned for Danger, Message in a Haunted Mansion, Treasure of the Royal Tower, The Final Scene, Secret of the Scarlet Hand, Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake, The Haunted Carousel, Danger on Deception Island, and The Secret of Shadow Ranch. Great games, strong games, all of them. Even Stay Tuned for Danger, which I don't like gives me the heebie-jeebies. It's still a strong game. It's done really well. Love these games. They are superb. I will cherish them forever. I have no doubt about that. I'm excited to be able to share them with my niece when she's old enough. She's only two, so it's going to be several years coming, but these are wonderful games. 
and they were great educational outlets. I loved the very different storylines. Again, the first 10 games, there was a lot of, there were a lot of possibilities. So the stories could vary a great deal uh, in the early days. And her interactive definitely did that, even when there is some overlap in terms of thefts and hauntings. And, you know, part of these mystery elements are repeated, but overall stories are quite different. And they're done so well. Great soundtracks. Some of the best of the batch are in these first 10. Uh, some great puzzles and great characters. Some of my favorite moments uh, are related to these first 10 games. So this is a really long video. I can't believe it's an hour long, but I hope you were able to stick with it. I thank you if you did. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more of these recap videos. Again, the next one won't be until I've finished the next batch of 10. So it'll be games 11 through 20. Probably won't be many, many months before I get to that. Uh, I'll thank you one more time for your patience and just for taking the time to click on the video and to watch it through to its entirety. Uh, that's just a wonderful thing. So thanks very much, everyone. And I will let you go and bring this video to an end. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.